Sir Nubang, now we, we are looking at the economy of Africa, we are looking at geopolitics and the, uh, its inf uh, influence or impact on African economy. Now the question is, to what extent, uh, Professor Nubang, uh, does geopolitical rivalry in Africa contribute to trade imbalance and uh, the protectionist measures across Africa? Wow, that's a very, very uh, tall one. To what extent do geopolitical influences contribute to trade imbalances and protectionist tendencies on the continent? Well, I think that classical trade analysis would get us to understand that trade in Africa is, is very peculiar in, 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 so many, in so many respects. Uh, of course, the reality is not spread, is not unique across the continent. Uh, but there's one common characteristic that is shared largely across sub-Saharan Africa is the fact that trade is largely natural resource-based. Uh, even a country as advanced as South Africa has uh, natural resources as a significant component of its, of its trade uh, uh, basket. Um, in other parts of the, of the continent, um, it's still hugely natural resources. So either your traditional oil, oil exportation or your colonial era, uh, Korean era uh, cash uh, crops uh, feeding the metropole kind of basket of trade and, and 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 the composition of trade across African countries has not changed enormously you know over the last four or five decades uh, there are very few countries on the continent that have really succeeded to diversify and particularly break into uh, trading of, of, of manufacturing products um, you have manufacturing hubs here and there across the continent in Southern Africa and South Africa, in Egypt and some North African countries, Nigeria to a certain extent. Um, but, but these are not globally competitive players in, in, in terms of gaining access to global share of, of, of manufactured products. And to the extent that you are looking at uh, the, the trade being predominated by primary resources and natural resources, and natural products and agricultural products on the continent. These are not really uh, commodities that tend to be influenced by, by geopolitics. Uh, market access is determined by, by, by the, 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 the market holders uh, in the north. Uh, there's a certain extent to which uh, market access is also facilitated by bilateral and multilateral agreements. So your, your economic partnership agreements, EPS with the European Union, your AGOA, uh, with the U.S. and such such uh, strategic partnerships that uh, sometimes have security, trade, uh, and economics all wrapped up into into such arrangements. So, African countries are not really protectionists in 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 the in the classical sense of the word, uh, because they are largely exporters of primary products and largely consumers of manufactured products. Uh, and the only extent to which there will be variations in trade would be affected by the extent to which they have established uh, free trade agreements and, 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 and common custom unions and, 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 and common areas. So they are, they are, they are bilateral and uh, uh, multilateral engagement with specific trading blocks like the European Union and, and, uh, uh, and, and the U.S. and to a certain extent the bilaterals they have with China. Uh, so, so the short version of my response to you would be because of the nature of the products which we currently trade largely, uh, and because of the nature of the kind of interaction between Africa and its strategic partners, those things get regulated already within those arrangements. So when the European Union sets uh, economic partnership agreements with most African countries, it influences access to European Union markets. Um, so apart from the ones that are, are, are set with people like the European Union, you do have bilateral arrangements between specific countries. The one aspect which I haven't yet touched on, which I think is very important for where we are going to, is the extent to which we have intra-African trade. Uh, and, 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 and classical integration literature makes us understand that that's very critical, even for things like the, Africa, the continental future area that we are seeking to pursue. And I think that therein lies another huge opportunity that we need to take advantage of. Uh, because to a certain extent, there's a sense in which greater inter-African trade and trade among African countries is going to promote and deepen integration. Uh, it's going to also broaden not just economic integration, but even political integration. Because as we classically say in, 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 in trade economics, 
even though we talk about trade uh, happening between countries, it's actually businesses that do interact with each other in terms of goods and services and uh, moving across boundaries and, and people. So there's the whole debate that has to come with the contractual trade area about facilitating movements of goods uh, and services across boundaries and the whole debate of movements uh, uh, of, of peoples that we are seeing in an increasing measure happening at the sub-regional level. So your CEMAC, your SADEC, your ECOWAS are facilitating movements of people um, and goods to a fairly large extent. So the continent has made a lot of progress in that area, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. You know, the whole advent of the African Union passport, the whole advent of free movement. And we are seeing that there's progress in that regard in a number of countries, you know, like, like Ghana and Rwanda, and uh, an increasing number of countries like Kenya and I think Cameroon recently are either switching to the e-visa uh, access for African passport holders, uh, uh, visa online or visa at the border or no visa at all. So, so there's a sense in which as far as the facilitation of movements of people across boundaries uh, to ultimately deepen trade and deeper integration, that is already happening. Where the lacune, the missing piece, where which we which which i think is critical for where we need to go to has to do with our contribution to global production value chains our contributions uh, in ter relative percentage terms to global trade uh, contributions in relative percentage terms to attracting global foreign direct investments which are all uh, critical components that are indicative of a growing and a healthy economy uh, and i think that as far as that is concerned we are still very, very, very uh, many, many years, uh, uh, light years behind because uh, it speaks to questions of beneficiation of min minerals, value addition in production, so that we do not just, uh, in a classical case, you know, in the case of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, the Cote d'Ivoire and the Ghana war when it comes to issues of cocoa, is being able to tap into the global production value chain of chocolate, for example, you know, and, and that is where there's accrual and accumulation of value. Well, and I think that the Ghanaian government for the last I listened is making progress in that in that regard. And we should have more of such conversations that runs across the continent, not just for the exportation of cocoa or coffee, but when it comes to minerals, you know, your diamonds and all the things that your cobalt, your nickel and all the things that go into the production uh, uh, value chain in, in, in the manufacturing centers of the world. But for that to happen again, brings back to my earlier point of development of human capacity, brings back to my earlier point of development of uh, technology capabilities because it's one thing to say you want to beneficiate it wants to say you want to add value it wants you to say you want to participate in an industrial process it's a completely different thing to have the capacity to do so now the advantage that advanced countries have over us and the one lesson that we can learn from the experience of the chinas and the indians of the world and i think china in this particular instance to africa represents a practical case and, and, and the new industrialized asian countries your south koreas of the world and your singapore's of the world are our textbook examples of the fact that in 30 40 years in three to four decades you can convert what was elsewhere considered a traditional agricultural economies to become an advanced modern uh, economy that is globally competitive and i think that south korea is the one example that really embodies that example so uh, uh, that defends that case you know, where it has come from a pure agrarian uh, economy in the 60s, 50s and 60s to being a, a global leader in producing a globally competitive brand like Samsung, uh, being competitive in the autom auto automobile industry. And so Africa then has that opportunity to ask itself the question, you know, China and South Korea make Africa to understand that it's possible and it's possible within 20, 30, 40 years. If you identify the levers of change, what is it that you need to do? What do these countries do that we need to do in order to develop the capability to become globally competitive? And technology in its nature, it's progressive. So we have not seen the end of innovation. And so there is still there, there are there are rooms, there's room for a lot of uh, for Africa to catch up and to leapfrog and to be to, to, to push itself onto the forefront. But for us to get there, there are lots of basics. There are still, we're still struggling with existential survival issues, you know. People are still dying in our hospitals from preventable diseases. Uh, in my beloved country, Cameroon, there is, there is a highway between uh, two major cities that is killing more people in peace time than certain countries have in certain conflicts. And this is, just blows my mind. For the life of me, I do not understand why we do not have a three to four lane highway between Douala and Yaoundé. And why it's taken us 10 years to construct such a highway 
so, so, so we can talk and be very optimistic about the future of Africa, but there are some low-hanging practical issues that would unlock the potential that is resting on the continent. And, and, and these are issues with institutions. This is issues just people being able to look, uh, um, putting in place governance institutions, governance mechanisms that says opportunities created, uh, people's uh, 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 capabilities are enhanced, and we lay the foundations for the, for the ingenuity, for the innovation, for the intelligence, the smartness that Africans possess to be unleashed. Right now, we are still busy with bread and butter issues. We are still trying to get people elected into office that are going to feel that they are accountable to the people. We are still trying to get people to take budgets from state treasury and execute them accountably. You know, we have a mixed traditional modern form of government in most of our African countries of people who are not yet thinking in terms of technological uh, cutting edge for the industrial revolution. You know, we had a story of our, one of our beloved ministers recently that went and brought us uh, laptops from China. Uh, which laptops uh, uh, our engineer uh, graduates in Polytech in Yaoundé, given the right resources, could manufacture those things on the, on, on the spot. So, so, so when, when you have these kinds of inefficiencies built into the system, then you see that politics and underdevelopment and perhaps mindset issues comes to act as barriers from us unleashing the potentials that we have. But as far as the world and our place in the world, it's open it's available for us for the taking. Are we going to do what we need to do at our level in order to unleash our potential? I think for me, that's where the questions lie, to, un un to unlock the potential at the low-hanging low fruit by just creating a culture of excellence, you know, getting our, our secondary school students and our university students to believe that hard work pays, you know, that you're not supposed to be related to the minister in order to be, ex to be able to successful in life. Uh, to be able to have people that are ingenious, that are creative, that are, are, are innovative, that, that we have a culture that encourages innovation by placing a premium and a value on it. Right now, we have a culture that encourages people to become uh, political entrepreneurs uh, that, that know how to use uh, public uh, procurement process to enrich themselves. That has to change if we're going to take advantage of the opportunities that, uh, that we have uh, as a continent, as a whole. And I think it's a very shared experience across the continent. Indeed, uh, Professor Nobong, uh, the, the goal is to see how uh, stakeholders uh, can be more pragmatic and intentional